back. Now, there's two more songs that I have to play tonight, and one of which was uh, a little slow for the morning time, a little slow, but it's mellow, and I like it. So I was thinking, man, I can't necessarily play it and put people to sleep when they're doing drive time, but I've got the solution, and the solution is I will let it play in the background while we talk, baby. Right? So this is ES Posthumous with the Moonlight Sonata, which is like really fantastic. You're, you're going to hear it in a second. But now, with the time that we have left, I do want to dive into a, a couple of questions that I've received. And one of them was really great and speaks directly to what it is that we've been talking about here. And doesn't everything I'm saying just seem like way more important now <laughs> with this in the background? Like there should be like wind blowing and stuff <laughs> while we're talking. All right, so here is the question that was submitted to me via formspring.me forward slash B Dave Walters. Form like membership form, spring like the season, dot me like me, forward slash B is in brother Dave Walters. And the question is I have a hard time separating letting it go and not caring about it. If I don't put some worry into getting something, I feel as if I'm not caring about it. It's a fine line, and I don't know the cutoff between worrying and not caring about something. Okay, so let me try and give you a little bit of insight into it. As I phase out ES Posthumous with the Moonlight Sonata, I'm playing it because I'm a man of my word. I said I would, and so I did. Now, how to separate for what we're talking about right now, non-attachment from not caring. And, and it is a fine line, I will admit that. And what you're looking for is again, we, we, we talked, I believe it was the first week, maybe the second week, about the fact that you want to think about your goals and you want to think about what you want to happen as much as you can without resorting to worry. In that line, I know it is a fine line, but that line is when you look at things and you're no longer happy and excited about it, but start being like, okay, so when is this going to get here? When is this going to happen? Uh, when am I going to meet that guy? When am I going to meet that girl? When am I going to find that job? Uh, you know, I got to pay the rent. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? When you get to the, oh, my God, what am I going to do phase, you've gone too far. Okay? Because like I said before, worry and faith cannot exist in the same place, okay? They're totally different from one another, right? They're apples and oranges. Again, either you trust God, you trust the universe, you trust the creator, or you trust the, the forces that be, or you don't. You trust that process, or you don't. And I know a lot of people that listen to the gospel music and have footsteps up on the wall or footsteps, footprints, the point footprints. Well, not foot, not <laughs> apparently. All right. Apparently about the one and a half hour mark is about the flub mark when I got two hours. So I got to condition myself to make it the whole way. But the point is, you know, these people, you know, these people that are always quoting Bible verses and, and, and always, you know, at the church five days a week. But as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as a bill's late, Soon as a check is smaller than they anticipate, soon as anything happens, oh my God, oh worry, 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 right? And it's not helping. It's just not helping, okay? So you can use these tools that I've shared with you to cultivate that, that, that mindset of knowing clearly what you want and being powerfully committed to what you want while accepting the fact that God or the universe may know better than you. You follow me? Because even though I don't really get into this, and you won't hear me say this too often, but it may be that there's things in this life that just aren't for you. It's possible. It is possible. But I feel for the most part, if you have that spark in your heart, you genuinely want something. Like you're way deep down inside, inside your belly, you want it. Then it's for you. It's for you. I mean, everybody wants a billion dollars, right? I mean, everybody would like to own a private island or something like that. I mean, that's, that's, but whether or not you wouldn't mind it and you want it are two different things. You follow me? So it, 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 it takes practice to cultivate this idea. But like I said, you may being led be 
you may be, wow, really? I can't talk anymore. Apparently, I'm out of talent. <laughs> Apparently, I got about 90 minutes worth, right? You may be being led in a different direction than where you wanted to go because you're being led somewhere better, right? That's how I look at things. That is what I trust and what I cultivate in, in the outlook that I have, and that's the relationship that I have with the Creator. I believe I shared with you before, when this opportunity to do this radio show came up, I didn't know at all this is what was happening. I didn't know at all that this was the opportunity that was about to come my way, even though having a radio show was something I wanted more than anything. Radio's down, TV's next. But I was just, you know, doodling along, looking at Craigslist one day, and I saw, I saw something that I thought might be interested and interesting, and I applied, and I didn't think it was going to be an opportunity of this magnitude. But the thing is, I was looking, and I took action. And something fantastic happened, right? So what you want to do is be clear on what you want. Be clear on what's supposed to happen. Be clear on what you would prefer while being able to accept if it's something else. Because if you get into the anguish, if you get into the anxiety, if you get into the worry, then you're clinging to it. You're attached to it. And that's the real benchmark of commitment versus being attached. When you start to feel the, the negative emotions, then it's attachment. When you just feel happy and excited and motivated and can't wait for it to happen, and it's kind of like a kid waiting for Christmas, that's commitment. And that's the line. And, and the question was, how do I know the line? That's the line. Now, how do you deal with it? You deal with it with the eight steps that I shared already. Okay? You deal with it with all the tools that I've shared with you. And more importantly, you just pay attention and start to guide your mind back. Most of us just let our minds do whatever it's going to do. Right. And here's another thing. This this is actually a pretty big secret that I want to share with you. So I want you to listen close. You ready for this? This is a huge secret. Just because a thought pops into your head doesn't mean you have to listen to it. Crazy, right? Just because a thought pops into your head doesn't mean that you have to listen to it. Okay. Just because something pops into your brain doesn't make it true. Right. Because, again, your brain and your mind will start to give you back things from the past. It will start to give you these same old ideas. It will start giving you what it thinks you want. Like we, we come into this world and it's like we've been given this supercomputer with no instruction booklet. <laughs> right. Like we've given a computer that, that could cure cancer and put a man on the moon. And instead, we kind of use it to play video games and occasionally, you know, watch videos on the Internet. Right. <laughs> you know, you can start using the capabilities that are inherent within you to start creating the life you want instead of letting it just kind of go crazy and create what it thinks you want or create more of what you've already got. You follow me? Now, I think we got time for at least one more question here. Let's see. Okay. Hey, a relationships question. You know, I, I say that I'm going to do this relationship stuff. And really, if you want more relationship stuff, then send me more relationships questions because I write a column about it. And if I don't get enough relationships questions, because I get a ton of questions, but usually they're about spirituality and things. So I'll, I'll start reading you some of the questions that I've written articles about because it's still relevant because there's a lot of people that are still kind of making the same mistakes in relationships. And all of these things I just shared with you will help you tremendously in your relationship. You know, look at how you can apply right speech to your relationships. Look at how you can apply right view to your relationships. Look at how you can apply just being aware of what's actually happening and what's really taking place versus what you're responding to. That you're talking to your partner about the situation that's right here in front of you and you're not still responding to the fact that you had an argument last week. Right? Because some of us do this. Some of us carry grudges. He didn't take the trash out on Tuesday, so you flip out and yell at him on Friday, and that doesn't help anybody. If you're upset about something, say something about it at the moment when it can be rectified. If something's disturbing you, say something at it at the moment that it can, something can be done about it. Because after that, all you can do is say, well, this thing happened, and I didn't like it, and your partner can hopefully apologize, and then you let it go. Because if the moment's passed, the moment's passed, right? But okay, here's a question. When I realize I like someone, I get some kind of block, block in my head, and I usually start to ignore them. I don't know what to say, how to act, 
etc. I'm not so young and this is not just a teenage problem. Any suggestions? You know I read these questions directly and sometimes English is a second language so I kind of have to filter it real time but I try not to filter it too much because I want you to get the exact gist of what they meant and not just what I think they meant because I still have to be careful about this like everybody. I have to be very clear that I'm addressing what was actually asked and not what I think was asked. And sometimes I have to ask, answer what's behind the question, which is, this is one of those things. This person says when they like somebody, they get a block and they start to ignore them. They don't know what to say, how to act, and they're not a young person. So they've been doing this for a long time. And the simple question is, or the simple answer is, at some point in the past, something happened to them that made them make the conscious choice that they weren't good enough to have those relationships. Those are some of the most damaging words you'll ever hear and they're words that we say to ourselves all the time in slightly different ways. I'm not good enough. At some point, they made the choice that they didn't deserve that relationship, that nobody that they were attracted to would want them, right? Now, I don't know who this person is. The question was asked anonymously. So maybe a person might be a little overweight and they just assume nobody's going to want them because they're a little overweight. But hey, there's people out there that love that, <laughs> that love that. Or more importantly, if you're unhappy with your own weight, lose some weight, <laughs> okay? Don't do it because you think somebody else wants you to do it. Do it because you want to do it. If you're happy with you and in your own skin, God bless you. In fact, you have to be happy with yourself right now because all you've got is you right now even as you continue to work towards something else. You've got to love yourself and believe that you're beautiful right now. You've got to love and believe that you deserve someone who's going to love you for who you are right now. You can't get into a relationship predicated on the future. Okay? You can't get into a relationship thinking, oh man, when she stops using heroin, she's going to be the best girlfriend ever. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Right. So the first thing I would say to this person in particular is figure out why it is then that you don't think that you deserve this good relationship. Why it is that you don't think you deserve this person who's going to love you and set you on fire and have a fulfilling, thrilling, loving relationship with. And the first place I would look is your own parents relationship. How did your father treat your mother? And how did your father treat you? That's the first step. Maybe daddy was nice to you, but he got drunk and hit mom. Well, that might kind of warp your ability to get into a healthy, constructive relationship. Maybe dad was a hard worker and always kept food on the table, but wasn't very really emotionally outgoing. And guys, we can get into this quite often, that it's like, well, I put food on the table, you know, clothes on your back. What else do you want from me? And the unfortunate answer is quite a bit quite a bit. Your kids need hugs more than anything. They, they need that, that love and that affection more than you know, especially little girls from their dad, especially little girls from your dad. Because let me tell you, brother, you don't give it to her. When she's about 16, she's going to go try and find it from somebody else. And then you're going to be loading your shotgun and things just go poorly from there. <laughs> okay? Like with my little girl, my three-year-old, Every night, right before she goes to bed, I say, Lexi, you are so smart and so pretty. And now, now she added in, and so cute. <laughs> I'm like, and you're so cute too. Yeah, good times, right? Because I want her to have that. I want her to have that from such a young age that she's smart and she's pretty, right? Because the world is set up, especially, unfortunately, especially what it does to women, and I apologize to you, my sisters, to beat you down and make you feel like you're not very special. Because a multi-billion dollar cosmetics industry needs you to think that you're not good enough right now, that your body's not good enough, so that's why you have to buy these jeans, that your skin's not good enough, so you have to make the, buy this makeup. And it happens to us guys, too, but I think uh, for a lot of reasons, guys are kind of innately resistant to this. We have our own I'm not good enoughs, but usually they're not in the area of appearance. Usually. Because a guy can look at another guy who's got a better body than he's got 
and rationalize it that you can still take him in a fight or that you're still better in bed than he is. I mean, this is really how guys think. I hate to tell you this. Like, we usually don't don't necessarily feel that threatened just by another guy's physicality. It's possible, but uh, usually not, right? So uh, 